Hey there, Beardos, it's Jake. I uh, just wanted to pop in with a quick spoiler alert. Uh, we are going to be talking about the content of the book, Infinite Jest, today. We read up to page 258, uh, just before the beginning of the chapter, marked 6 November, Year of the Depend Adult Undergarment. So if you haven't read up to there and you don't want to know what happens, uh, I would recommend reading more and then coming back and listening to us. Don't worry, it'll still be here whenever you're ready. Welcome to the Beardy Heads Book Club, a place where a pretentious hipster and a serial curmudgeon agree to disagree about just about everything. And now, without further ado, here they are. Hi, I'm Jake, and I drink my coffee before it's cool. And I'm Steven. I pissed in his coffee. <laughs> Welcome to uh, the second episode, really the first episode yeah, of it's Beardy Heads Book Club. Yeah, I'd say this is the first episode of Beardy Heads Book Club. Yeah. Um, we're picking up today again on Infinite Jest. Uh, if you heard before the show, I'll make sure to put in a little bumper that says where we read to so you don't find any spoilers. Um, but, yes, this is the first, the first quarter of Infinite Jest. And... We'll probably read it in fifths or sixth, maybe, <laughs> after this, because goddamn. Yeah, some of us are slow readers. I know, I know. Yeah, uh, for those of you not in the know, um, I, I I took about another week to get my reading done. Uh, I started classes this this uh, uh, last week, and on top of that, I have some... Uh, I just have a, a whole lot going on over here. I got oh, working a couple of jobs, you know, trying to keep the bills paid. But Whoa. I got, I got, I got caught up. That's the important <laughs> thing. Yeah, I, uh, I was done a week ago, and so I've been reading another book, waiting for you to catch up. Yeah, yeah. And that book That'll made happen. sense. That book had a coherent plot that right? was not that was not edited like a Tarantino movie. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, holy crap. This this David Foster Wallace must have loved fucking Tarantino. <laughs> and drugs. Oh god, drugs, Tarantino, and tennis. If I had to pick three <laughs> themes for this entire book. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. I want to talk about that opening scene. I want to talk about the way this book opens, because I feel like it's really important to setting the tone to the rest of the book. I did not understand that opening scene until about page two hundred and I don't know, 30, whenever I found out the timeline of the years, what right. years are in order. And then I was like, oh. Because that the... happens after everything, right? Like, this yeah. is post-ETA because he's trying to get into college. Well, the uh, have you noticed the quotation marks in this book? How they're all, uh, you know, one. The kind of quotation that you use uh, if you are quoting somebody in a quotation Yes, and yeah. then whenever they quote somebody in a quotation, they give them double quotes. Well, remember at the end of that first chapter, which was the Year of Glad, uh, there was a like a dude, a nurse, or somebody who said, what's your story? And I think the rest of the book is his story, and he's retelling it. Oh! Or at least he might think he is, because he is at a point to where he can't talk right <laughs> that was what really got me about the opening of this book is yeah. like you don't really know is he having a psychotic break or oh he is definitely is the, well i mean he does a really good job of going okay if he's having a psychotic break or maybe the rest of the world is going crazy around him i you think, know like and that's yes. the impression that i got and maybe like that was a cool way to me in in my opinion that was a cool way to represent that psychotic break oh yeah i loved it cuz everything was coherent in his head like when he was talking he's he's saying it but everybody's like what is he why is he making this noise and i'm like what's wrong with these people are they deaf yeah i was like what's going on like <laughs> you all fucking crazy like and then like his dad like you know there's there's scenes with his dad and you're just like oh, i don't i don't know like what's going on here and his dad like, is fucking weird he's like no put the book down put the book down no he's noticed how the dust is doing that i'm like really really dude is that how we talk yeah yeah oh it's it's uh yeah we, we, oh well that was that was much later that's uh that's his dad's dad that's his granddad talking to his oh, dad 
Oh shit! See, I I thought that was hip hop. Yeah. The, well, that's right because it was in the '60s. That was before the years had been subsidized. Right. That's that's 1960 BS, which is before subsidization. So, uh, yeah. Time which probably explain in this that. Book. <laughs> no, no numbers for years. No yep. numbers. They leave you to figure out the order of the narrative based on the dates and the events, just like the month and the day. And the yeah. events. That's all you get. <laughs> and they don't tell you what order the years are until about page 230 when somebody was like, oh, it's the year of this, the year of this, and the year of GLAD is the last one. And I think the year of GLAD was the last year of subsidization, I think. It's the last one they show, I believe. Um, yeah. I've been making liberal use of the Infinite Jest Wiki, I have to admit, because David Foster Wallace is one fuck of a lot smarter than I am. Yes. And he uses <laughs> words that I didn't even know there were root words for. Yeah, good thing you have a Kindle, and you could try to find a definition, and even the Oxford Dictionary is like, no, nah, dude, I can't help you. That's not a word. Which is ironic, because the Oxford Dictionary, uh, Oxford English Dictionary figures so heavily into... Uh, Hal's Hal's plot line. Yeah. So you have Hal, a rising tennis star under a lot of pressure. Um, smokes a lot of pot. Smokes a lot of pot. I did appreciate that. <laughs> um, kind of does it the same way, you know, the rest of us adults do, which is secretly. Mm-hmm. Um, why a little bit older beyond his years? To be honest with you, like I was kind of, I don't know. He's kind of like a he's he's sort of like a savant, I, I guess you could say, because he it, he memorizes the dictionary, and also his uh, brother is like a film savant, like uh, Mario, his, well, his 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 uh, disabled brother. Yeah, he's actually disabled, but he is also a film savant. Yeah, yeah, he's a complete film savant and entertainment savant. And then and, he has another brother, O, who is a football kicker for the Arizona Cardinals. Who uh, I guess has one foot that's more muscular than the other. I think they keep one hinting whole at. side of his body because keep in mind he started out playing tennis at at, at uh, infield. infield. Yeah, oh, okay. uh, yeah. That was that was an interesting chapter. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. Uh, moving on a little bit uh, now that we've kind of introduced the characters, I still have no fucking clue what this book is about. I know vaguely that there is this that Hal's father has has filmed this thing with a deformed woman and uh it is the most entertaining thing ever constructed do you know do you know why she's deformed um i made the mistake of looking at the wiki so yes (laughs) because i was like i think this might be madame psychosis but they're not giving me anything to go on Um, yeah yeah and then i looked forward and i was like okay madame psychosis it is madame psychosis and then i was like i look down and i see disfigurement and i'm like ooh. Yeah. I can't I can't not read that. There was a quick little line where they were referring to O and he was describing him as an acid dodger. Did you see that? An acid dodger. As in somebody was throwing acid at somebody and he dodged out of the way and they didn't. Oh holy shit. And it was also hinted at that uh, the mom thinks that uh her the dad uh had an affair with her. Because you know she she was in all the films and and O even mentions that he knows that they never fooled around. I think that was in an end note. And yes. uh, I guess you could assume that the mother threw acid in her face at the dinner table, and O dodged and she didn't. Oh, so you think it happened that late in life? Because see, I kind of thought that O was involved with her after all that. I thought I, that o, o was involved with her like after. You know, I thought he was okay with the deformation, but that's a little. They don't. I haven't gotten to. I don't know if you've gotten to the deformation yet. I think. But. I think O is. I think O had a thing for her before, because I think after that, I think that uh, that ruined the relationship between O and his mom, because he doesn't talk to his mom, and he has obviously has some mommy issues because he only hooks up with girls that have kids that are yeah. single. <laughs> so I. I think because what's her face the the what's her name Nadia is that the deformed one. Um, Joel. Joel, yeah. Uh, AKA Madam Psychosis. Yeah. Uh, she, I don't think, has a kid, so she wouldn't have been his type beforehand. Yeah. Or she would have uh, been his type beforehand. That's me just spitballing there, though. Clearly, clearly, issues is a theme in this book. Just oh, daddy yeah. issues, mommy issues. Um, Hal, uh, that last chapter we read. Oh, I love before. that chapter. Oh, my God. That was the best about... chapter. 
And the end. Okay, we'll get we'll get there. We'll get there toward the end. But I want to talk about the second chapter. And okay. I want to talk about the second chapter merely because I have been on the other side of that where uh, I've been waiting for the drug guy to show up. <laughs> and like, but he took the anxiety of just waiting for the weed to show up. And he ramped it into something that made me like scratch invisible bugs. Like I felt like a junkie reading that chapter. That was when I was like, Oh my God, this guy, this guy is a more brilliant writer than mm-hmm. I had anticipated. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause I mean, you, you get the sense when you read it that he, he's been through that. I mean, you know, David Foster Wallace, he, I guess it's documented that he did have a drug problem. Uh, and I, I don't think anybody, unless you've been in a scenario similar to that could even come close to writing like that. Cause that was, I mean, I've never been in that situation. I'm like, I don't, I'd never even thought any of this. <laughs> yeah. So no, yeah. it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. Like the first probably three, four chapters was just ratcheting up the tension and the anxiety in the book and just making it a little worse and making it a little worse and making it a little worse. And then it's like, it's like going up that hill that yeah. first hill on a roller coaster and then the rest of the book i guess it's just the rest of the roller coaster but god damn that first hill oh <laughs> uh, i he uh there's another part where um it was a scene i don't know who the narrator of it was but it was just the way they talked it made no sense it was just all slang and i guess they were street talk or whatever but, oh the junkies uh, yeah, the junkies, and I, I didn't really know what was going on because it was. I mean, I thought I was, I was reading uh, Clockwork Orange at one point because I was like, I don't know what the fuck they're saying. I think and they then, even said droogies, although that yeah. might have been in a different, a different chapter. And then I, I have the note here. I wrote, I go the chapter with the drunk, the chapter with the junkies was super incoherent, and that is a word I use a lot with this book is coherence or incoherence because a lot of it is that. Um, and he says, and I wrote until the one dude shot up with Drano. And then I was like, "Oh shit! Now I know what's going on." And then I'm like, "Why did they? Why did they kill him?" I didn't quite get why the dude was killing him. Um, it was was something to do. Oh, I forget what the guy what the guys had done. Yeah. Um, they did something to the guy who sold them the heroin. They yeah. burned him on a couple like a, a couple hundred bucks or something. And that was how he got him back. And that, that well, was that's just, fair. From, from what I read, they were just associated with the people who did that. And the one of them was the 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 cross dresser, who yeah. uh, <laughs> just sits there and watches the guy shoot up a Drano because she knows what's happening. Was that before? Or he uh, knows. That, I don't would know. that be the Would that be the same cross dresser that had the uh, the heart transplant that was in a purse? yes. Yes. So I guess that was after the fact. Those two link up together. Yeah. I, I I don't know if that happens before or after, to be honest with you. Oh, well, yeah. after, obviously, because the, the crossdresser had to have died. Oh, no, wait. The crossdresser snatched the purse. What no, the crossdresser snatches the purse and, and, yeah. and takes everything. Like the, it's it's uh, Or poor Tony. That's 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 the name. Damn. Uh, poor Tony is the one who... Uh, she, it's Later, it's referred to that she takes the first artificial heart. Yeah. Or he takes the fir- first artificial heart. Whatever. And uh, it's still beating, and then she, like, throws it in a dumpster or something? Oh, <laughs> man. Smashes it and then throws it in the dumpster. Like, Damn. oh, my God. Like, what the fuck is that all about? <laughs> and I will tell you that this book does a really good job of lulling you into a sense of confidence and going, okay, now we're going to have a really big, long... So, uh, the crossdresser takes the heart, smashes it, um... Yeah. So, anyways, what I was saying at this book, like, there's this, there's this uh, feeling of like tediousness. Uh, very like he lulls you into a sense of of false security, and he goes, mm-hmm. "Okay, I'm just gonna make everything very detailed and talk about everything in very broad terms." But then, like, when you least expect it, I'm just gonna like grab a baseball bat and smash a kitten with with it. <laughs> like, boom. Well, there was that one quick little aside uh, in the first, I guess it was the first chapter, where it was Hal as a, as a baby, as a toddler, and he's trying to remember, or he's remembering something, and that the way he described that, that scene, uh, it reminded me of a, uh, what's his name, Richard, Richard Linklater? I don't know. That, what was that little meaning of life or whatever? artsy fartsy shit he made a a couple years ago but it reminded me of that like the camera work in that 
the way it was described. Oh, and, boyhood. Uh, uh no 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 not the other one uh what's that there's a there's a director in austin who makes some weird ass movies and he made a movie it was brad pitt Jessica chastain i don't know it was weird but anyways tree of life is that it i think that was tree it. of life i think that's it yeah is that richard linklater i don't know if i'm getting that wrong i'm an idiot i usually am spot on with directors but um the way he describes it like he picks up something and he eats it and the mom a, who is a germ freak um runs around the backyard and laps the kid like a couple of times freaking out like my baby ate that or some shit like that and ever since then i'm like what what the fuck did that baby eat what it, yeah i couldn't decide if that was just say, showing that like and it might have been later in the book that they're showing that she's like become a germaphobe and an agoraphobe mm-hmm. and for some reason which they haven't explained yet um and that was like showing the early stages of it because she's actually outside, she's planting the garden and everything. But like, it felt integral somehow. Like, oh yeah, the filth. I didn't know what it meant. Oh, we're gonna. It's gonna come back to that, and we're gonna find out what the fuck that was because I, I, I. That's I hope important. So I, I really felt like it was important for them to like stop this very like the opening of the book really like the ent- setting the entire stage and then going back to this one little place. Yeah. Man. It just. All right. Did you remember that chapter with? Uh, I don't even know who the narrator was, but it was about the kids and there was a kid that was being hit with a coat hanger that was being beat with a coat hanger by its. Parent. Oh my god. Yeah. What? Who, who was that? One of the the drunk the junkies as a child, maybe? Or I am not really sure. Uh, that was another one that didn't make a whole lot of sense. And that would also bust my theory that this whole thing is just Hal narrating it in his head. But Well, yeah, because then, you know, you have a sides that are Orin, and then there's Hal's father, or uh, uh, Hal's father's, Hal's father being talked to by his father. Yes. Um, like, there's there's things that Hal couldn't possibly have seen. Like, even, I, I, you know, things that happened before Hal was born. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like, I'm not really sure... Maybe yeah. it's a style. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure what what that was all about. Now, there is one thing about this book that, uh, besides you know kids getting hit with hangers and hearts getting snatched out of purses and people shooting up with Drano and bleeding out of all their orifices, there's another thing that really, really bothered me. There is an employee at this tennis school that lives on people's sweat. Oh, my God. Oh, what is it? Lyle. And he gives you workout advice, and he's really nice, but he wants to lick your sweat off of you. <laughs> and it, they even go, they're like, it's not sexual, you know, it's not something that, like, we need to be worried about. But they're like, <laughs> still, there's this guy that just hangs out in the weight room and licks the sweat off people's bodies. And that's like, all he ingests, uh, and, apparently. And everyone becomes okay with it, is the except, implication. Except freshmen. They all start out hating him, and he just like sits there, not really smug, but you know, not going to give them workout advice, and just watches, right. them, watches them fuck up until they, until they let him lick him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that guy, and I'll be honest with you, I don't think there's a single sane character in this book. No, I don't. I mean, because Hal is clearly losing it. Uh, well, he's like got some crazy anxiety we, OCD thing going on. We've definitely seen that he's lost it. <laughs> we know yeah. that opening. Um, Hal's dad was definitely not all there. Um, oh no! Considering, especially <laughs> based off that third chapter. <laughs> yeah, considering well that and and uh, the manner in which he departs this world uh, was quite insane. Uh, he kills himself. Obviously, I mean they. I always talk about him in the past tense in the book, and then I'm like, "How did he die?" And then they say, "Oh, he killed himself." I'm like, oh, "Okay, how did he kill himself?" And then they go into detail, and I'm like, "Okay, that's See, cool." I thought the head in the microwave was a joke. I thought somebody was joking about that. I didn't realize that not only was it a joke, but then Hal is the first person to find him, and the manner the manner in which he died. Like I thought, oh, he put his head in the microwave, and I don't know how that's going to kill you. And then all of a sudden, he's like, oh no, his head exploded, and the yeah. microwave. And I'm like, oh, and yeah. the microwave, and it splattered. It was yeah. They talked about the gore, like the explosion, like what the fuck? <laughs> and um, who the fuck came up with that as an idea to kill himself? Well, somebody in this book did. 
I don't know. I kind of feel like it had something to do with the sh- with the film itself. Yeah, I think maybe he. Well, he had to have edited it. Um, I don't know. And maybe... do you think maybe the just the very act of editing it like drove him a little bit crazy, or that he knew what he did? Maybe. I guess, and I mean, there's some reason he made that film, like because he's tried to make it several times. Did I mean obviously because there was an end note that was about four or five pages it was in the, the book fi- it was the fifth time fifth time was the charm yeah and the, it was the in his filmography you could see that he tried to make and the film's name is infinite jest and uh yeah somebody came out and said you should make this i don't know who that is because obviously the film is dangerous which i believe is the main main plot device i guess so the main i think the book is about this film thing and he's just Really slow at introducing the characters because you know he writes like Tarantino. Yeah, he's gonna he's like okay, you're gonna get a glimpse of this guy first, but then later on, I'm gonna tell you what that was all about. Yeah, he writes like Tarantino. If you know Tarantino was a genius, and clearly Tarantino is not at all on this guy's level, David Foster okay. Wallace. So, um, well, we'll, well, we'll save like we'll say in the last fifteen, we'll we'll, we'll just go general impressions, but. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, it reminds me a lot of Philip K. Dick every time he talks about drugs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which was, I think, pretty much on purpose. Uh, Philip K. Dick being like some, you know, like scanner darkly level. Uh, especially that second chapter reminded me a lot of uh, Freck. The, I don't know if you ever read Scanner Darkly, but surely mm-hmm. you saw the movie. No, I didn't. No. I didn't read it. Oh, you didn't see the movie either? I saw the movie, but I couldn't tell you what it was about. Oh, okay. But there's this scene where, like, there's a guy, and he's slowly, like, going through withdrawals, and he thinks he has these bugs all over him. And that that second scene reminded me of that very, very much. It even has a little <laughs> uh, reference to insects. Um, but, yeah, the way he introduces it, it's almost like he just sort of uh, wrote the book in order and then chopped it up and shuffled it up like cards. Yeah. I'm not sure there's any rhyme or reason to the way he shuffled it, but I, there has to be. Like, okay. <laughs> all I know is, is I'm, I bet his editor was like, "Oh God damn it!" <laughs> you know, I was reading that his editor, uh, one of his books, uh, the the last book, the book he left with his suicide note, um, the last book he wrote started out as 2,000 pages as a manuscript, but it was released as 500. Damn. Uh, 500 page manuscript. So he got rid of three quarters of what uh, David Foster Wallace had written. Shit. So, yeah. There has to be, I think without David Foster Wallace's input, you would see a lot less um, Oh yeah. Oh, the, the, the scene where the girl gets beat with the coat hanger that doesn't really seem to have any, uh-uh. any significance. The junkies don't seem to have small significance. But then again, I'm like, you know what? The way he wrote this book, I don't think halfway through the book or even a quarter through the book is the time to start going like, oh, that didn't mean anything. Like, Yeah, I think they're going to cross paths at one point because I have a feeling this is like uh, similar to like Snatch. Um, I use Snatch as an example because I just recently rewatched it for like the millionth time. But yeah, there's all these different characters and they all have their goofy, wacky shit going on with them. They're all flawed as hell. And then they all interact, they all intersect at least at one point, even if it's just like driving down the road at the same time they were walking down the sidewalk. I think something like that is going to happen. And if you're not paying attention, you probably won't even see it. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah, there, there's there's little little bitty scenes where it's like, you just sort of get a glimpse of this other movie that's going on. And then another chapter, that's the movie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Let's see, what else? Didn't. <laughs> I guess you're going in, in order. <laughs> I don't well, know kind of, sort of. I'm I'm jumping around. You know, but you know my brain. Oh, I yeah. Mine was that way reading this fucking thing. Uh, uh, yeah, this this whole. Uh... Okay, let's talk about Madam Psychosis. <laughs> I want to talk about Madam Psychosis because Madam Psychosis. I don't know why. I have the two characters I feel the most affinity for in this book are Madam Psychosis and Hal. And I yeah. don't know why I feel such affinity for Madam Psychosis. Well, isn't Madam okay? Madam Psychosis was uh, the Joel. Yeah, Joel. Uh, isn't she? Wasn't she trying to kill herself in the bathroom? Trying to kill herself with by smoking a shit ton of crack. 
Well, that'll I guess that'll do it. I don't know much about crack except that uh, it's whack. And yeah, I don't smoke it. That's what I know. <laughs> I know I don't smoke it, so I guess that would be a way to kill yourself. I don't know. I figured there'd be more pleasant ways to do it, but hey, whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in I the bathroom too. at a party. Wasn't it in a bathroom at a party? It was at a, in a bathroom at a party, she not only cooks the crack, yeah. but then constructs a crack bong of some sort. Out of a Pepsi bottle. Out of a Pepsi bottle, and then smokes enough crack to... I don't think she dies. I don't think she succeeded, no. Yeah, the implication is sort of like, oh, somebody was waiting outside and it was just, the, you know, at the right time. And she's like, oh, damn, I guess I can't kill myself now. I'll just smoke a lot of crack later. Maybe yeah. that's like her cycle. That's what she always does. Like, she plans to kill herself every time she goes to get high because it's the last time. The last time, and I'm just going to go out with a bang. And then she starts smoking and then something happens. She's like, oh, well, I guess I'll do it again later. There I'm is high, like... Though. There is this huge overtone to, like, the cyclical nature of drug use. Like, yeah. the first guy is, like, every time he's, he buys a shitload of weed. By the way, uh, in case you were wondering, um, he buys 200 grams. That's 7.14 pounds. Damn. That's seven pounds of weed. Where is he uh, getting his money? I don't know. I, it's implied, I think, that he's, he's, he's rather well off. Yeah, uh, that he's got a decent job and stuff because like they talk about his apartment being well appointed and stuff like that. Uh, that's before it's destemmed and deseeded because this was before the time when weed was good. And yeah, it had a bunch of stems and seeds in it, so you're probably talking more like three or four pounds. Yeah, but still, three or four pounds, three or four pounds of weed, and this guy is planning to binge on it over a weekend. Oh god, like a long weekend, like. <laughs> And then, like, he breaks everything, he calls all his contacts, he says, don't talk to me again, like, I'm trying to quit, and he throws it, He throws all his shit away, he flushes everything else, and he goes back up until he's like, I'm gonna have a little bit. There's another character later on, I can't remember, has a very similar thing, and she keeps talking about how there are these brass one-hitters, and there's probably, like, a whole dump truck full of brass one-hitters that will go to the... We'll go to the dump every month because she keeps quitting and throwing all her stuff out. But then she'll go <laughs> buy more pot. And then even Joel, uh, there seems to be this like, yeah, I've done this before. You know, you're, you're exactly right. It, it does seem cyclical where she's like, uh, no, I told him last time was the last time. But this is really going to be the last time. And, it's and he because always I'm gonna kill myself. Yeah. And he always sells it to her again. Well, yeah, he's a crack dealer, and you know, I mean, you know, her drug dealer's like, okay, okay all right, well, I believe yeah. you. Yeah, well, good luck on that suicide. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll be yeah, here. Does, I'll be here next week. I got a it, deal going. It does make you wonder. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for doubling my going rate, uh, <laughs> which they sort of threw out there at, at the last minute, and I was like, what? Like she just pays them double the money, and then she goes back. But yeah. anyways. Uh, yeah, there's this very it's it's a lot about cycles in general. Like as far as like Hal's father uh, keeps trying to make the movie again and again and again and again and again, and it's cyclical. And like, yeah. uh, who else uh, sort of has a cycle going? Um, I don't uh, know. Oh, uh, he always he always gets gets right. with the same same type of girl and and that's calls the same his thing. It's the, exactly. It's the same thing, except it has to do with sex. It's like the sex, uh, you know. And the, he buys, and he always buys the kid uh, when he breaks it off with the woman. He always buys the kid like a bunch of really nice toys. And that, yeah, I do. I, I, I wonder if that has to do with he wants to be a dad, or all I know is anytime there's a chapter involving him. He is one. He just comes off as just this angry, angry motherfucker. <laughs> he just Man. seems pissed at everything and insane. Like yes, as is everybody, leaving bugs under glasses because he can't. Uh, yeah. Oh, that was weird. And man. he throws it away and the glass at a dumpster a couple of streets away. Or some yeah, shit like that because he like, doesn't the want fuck? them coming back at all. Oh yeah, and and roach dioxide. That's a that's a phrase I probably could have gone my entire life without hearing. Oh uh, yeah, or he uh, what was it? A a bird fell in his pool or something like that. He's oh just man, sitting there. <laughs> so let me ask you this: Do you think maybe he has a little bit of his mother's of Avril's uh, 
aka the moms yeah uh do you think he has a little bit of her uh germophobia agoraphobia oh totally totally and and i know he hates his mom he hates her for some reason and you know i suspected it when i told what i said earlier about the acid but i think he uh he has a little bit of a mother in him but i don't know if he quite realizes it or he does and it just that's why he's always mad maybe yeah but uh that's why i i mean the thing he does with the the single moms of the kids you know that's total mommy issues there oh yeah yeah he's trying to bang moms and then he feels guilty about it because they've got kids and mm-hmm. yeah the whole uh i do think that there is a lot of uh it's implied that that uh their father killed himself because he found out their mother was cheating on him. Yes. So this is this is kind of my theory right now is with that the guy that works there now, right? The the stepdad, the T C T or whatever. Yeah, yeah. C T. Uh, it's impl- it's very heavily implied that C T has uh, a few fingers in their mom. <laughs> most of the chat for most of the uh, <laughs> yeah he does most of the book. Um, I really want a chapter with the mom. Um, I just want to see how fucking batshit she is now. I would be really interested because there are a few places where you do see her sort of pop in. She pops in for a little bit. Because if all these characters are fucked up, um, you you kind of get the sense that somebody somewhere made them this fucked up. Uh, and I just want to see how fucked up that person is. Because I think it all... The, I blame the mother. <laughs> I blame the parents. Yeah, I'm getting all Dr. Phil here, but it's Where's the mother the and where's fault. the father? That's where you gotta look. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, obviously, because, you know, Hal, he was probably a normal kid, but it, his mom's all fucking crazy. Of course, what the fuck did he eat? Maybe that what? fucked him up. <laughs> oh, my God, that's what I keep thinking. Is I'm like, what if this is like, what if he found his dad's, like, acid ergo fungus, you know? Yeah. Ergot fungus. Like, and yeah. he's going to, you know, and he actually, and that's what made him fucking crazy. He got ergotamine poisoning or something. Oh, and maybe now it, he's, I don't know. Maybe it helped his brain so he can memorize shit too. For that matter, what do you think the great concavity is? Uh, I don't know. Convexity, <laughs> concavity. I feel like it's, 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 I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on with Canada in this book. <laughs> well, I, that's it. actually in my notes, uh, I wrote, because those chapters didn't make a lot of sense, and apparently it made a lot of sense to you because you texted me about it, and you loved that scene. But I wrote, I know something is going on with the Canadian wheelchair assassins. I couldn't tell you, though. Okay, so they do that much. They imply that something's going on with the Canadian wheelchair assassins. But then this other guy, Steeply, he has gone over as a double agent because he's he works for the U.S., He's a double agent for the wheelchair assassins, but now he's a triple agent because the wheelchair assassins think that he's double agenting for them when he's really double agenting for the agency that he's he was originally double agenting for. <laughs> so that's the setup there. What okay. The fuck. <laughs> yes. That is his cover. It's the best fucking cover ever. It's like this crazy double blind, like the whole time he's talking to Marath, you you're like, uh, Marath has this like very Quebecois uh, confidence to him. This very French like, yes, we know what we are doing. And you have <laughs> you have no clue. You know, you know, one day you will all be French like us. And Marath or Steeply is just like, uh huh. Yeah, sure, I'm just gonna buff my nails. And, you know, adjust my bra strap and like. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> because he has to go undercover as a woman. <laughs> And that's the thing, you know. This is regarded as highbrow literature. Like, yes, this is this is literary, literary snobs drool over this book, and most and of them don't even read it. And that's it probably, involves an entire it's... legion of men in wheelchairs who are assassins, <laughs> and they're on the hunt. I mean, they're obviously on the hunt for the tape, the the Infinite Jest film. I couldn't tell if they were on the hunt for it or if they had already distributed it. Well, they call I th- it. I think they just call it the entertainment, or they have another yes. name for it. The Sammy's dot. Yes. And uh, the now let me talk about that. That that tape, the first instance where you see it happen, because you, you kind of vaguely know about this tape, because they, they kind of talk about it on the back of the book, but uh, it's, it's kind of terrifying uh, what happened, because 
it's it's a tape where you watch it and you just stop giving a shit about everything and that's all you want to do is the fucking tape is watch the tape like you're addicted to watching the entertainment <laughs> and i think that's where we're gonna see like a lot of that theme of cycling but no uh, uh, but going back to that scene with um with the spies Mm -hmm. Uh, The reason I like that scene so much is because uh, he writes in a third person uh, uh, omnipotent, which is you're in a third person view. Everybody is is referred to in the third person, but you know what everybody's thinking and the way he switches from character to character to character. Like, just between those two characters, like, one person is talking, and the other one is responding to him, and then it switches, and the other one is responding to that guy who is talking. And it, like, it's seamless. It just goes back and forth and back and forth, and it's sort of yeah. framed with all this stuff that's going on back at the Academy, which I think was, like, um, I think that's the scene where Mario almost gets gets diddled by the by the, the 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 other tennis player the the, the woman tennis player who's uh, i forget what their what her name is they call her like the mss oh the uss the, millicent the uss millicent which yeah, is the, she is down to fuck oh man if you are lonely tonight guys give a call to the uss millicent which is her name because what is it her hair sticks up like the top of a submarine or something like the top of a submarine so yeah or the prow of a battleship i can't remember the fuck <laughs> oh dude that scene was completely nuts and i didn't understand it at all but they that's like were most looking, of the book well they were looking for a camera tripod which i i have a feeling that's important um that was too that was too the fact that it was actually there yeah the, there's a camera tripod just fucking sitting there and i'm like how is this like they just they're talking and it just seems like nobody's really listening to each other when they talk. And she's talking about this and then he starts talking about this. And I'm like, are you are y'all in the same are you having the same conversation right now? And then, yeah, and I'm like, we're, we're not talking about the goddamn tripod that there's a fucking tripod there for some reason. Why is there a fucking tripod? In the right. middle of the wooded area, right? And it's... Hal, and it's funny because you know exactly what Hal's gonna do as soon as they go out in the woods. Hal's like, "I'm gonna go this way, bye." And you're like, "I'm gonna, oh. go, I gotta go get some quiet time." And he's gonna go fucking get high. And I just, that's like, that's great. <laughs> I, I, and that's, I, I like the OCD ness of his getting high. But yes, the tripod. What the fuck is it there for? Oh, because it's important. It's implied that that Mario does all the filming and everything. Like, mm-hmm. Mario is the AV guy. He's the AV nerd because he's, like, a savant for movie making. Yes. And they just strap a camera on him in some in some scenes. And they're just like, no, walk around and go watch this stuff. You yeah. Know? And uh, he's just, it, it's implied that he's pretty good at, at the film work. And he's given access to the lab where he can work on the film stuff. But why doesn't he know about this tripod? That's why it was important to me. Because he, it was interesting to him. Yeah. Instead of going like, oh yeah, that's uh, what's his name? That's the crazy German guy's tripod. You know, he uses it to film what's her name in the sh- the USS Millicent, the shower. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, back to the. Uh, I know I keep going back to the spy scene. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, you I loved it, about, and I was just like, I don't know what the fuck was going on. Well, it, it was a tiny little bit of espionage novel in this book, which is desperately like. I don't know why I like espionage so so much. I love espionage novels and stuff. Oh, yeah. I like Robert Ludlum. <laughs> and this was like taking that and putting it into the Infinite Jest universe, and it was as insane as that could possibly be. <laughs> like, and silly. It was just it was we, silly. But it was also serious. Because it was, it was like the writing, number one, for such a silly scene, that's some of the most brilliant dialogue I've ever seen written. Like the whole, you know, the way that like when Marath is the is the point of view character, every little detail that Steeply does, everything that Steeply does is intricately monitored and written down because he's supposed to be like taking taking note of everything. Whereas when it's Steeply, he's just going like, oh, this fucking French dumbass. Like, <laughs> he doesn't know what the fuck's going on. This poor fuck. <laughs> And they're in wheelchairs. And he, they're all in wheelchairs. And then they <laughs> appear later in the book. And oh, I don't know oh, if you caught that. What's oh, his oh, name? Isn't oh, he's like, there's a bunch of cripples following me around. Yeah, he's like, there's a bunch of cripples following me everywhere. <laughs> and you're like, no, those are wheelchair assassins. Stop it. <laughs> I love 
love that chapter when he's oh. talking to his brother. He's like, one of them's talking about there's a bunch of cripples following me. And the other one's like, I bet I could clip this toenail and hit that trash can and another then, time. <laughs> somehow, okay, well, we we can we can go to that point. Let's go ahead and talk about that last chapter because I feel like we picked accidentally the best place we probably could have <laughs> yes. stopped in this book because oh, that chapter was, was amazing. That was the best. That was my favorite chapter in the whole book. I mean, I was just like. First of all, I was like, well, I get to stop reading this for a week because Jake is slow. But second of all, <laughs> that was a fantastic chapter. The Just the conversation between them two is great because it's like one is obviously smarter than the other. And and it's just like they're – and it was, again, another conversation where it's like, are they really having the same conversation? Because one's like, oh, there's a bunch of people following me around the cripples. And his response is like, I'm clipping my toenails. And, and I, I keep I keep nailing the trash can. And then the other like, one's they like, just keep going in the trash can. I think I'm in the zone, and I don't want to let the magic go. And he's like, and then I feel like I'm going to mess up because I keep thinking I'm in the zone or some shit like that. And yeah, but like, no, really, these these French cripples, I keep seeing them everywhere. And, uh, oh, by the way, dad's dad. <laughs> And let's talk about how he died. Oh which... no, it was it was somebody's interviewing him for an interview, and he doesn't know a lot about his family, and he he wants to know stuff, and or he just doesn't talk about him a lot, or he's not good at it, or something. And so he's like asking Hal about it, and then just somehow it comes up to how did Dad kill himself? And you know he just thought because you know oh Hal found him, but he didn't really know the full extent to it and how just kind of matter of factly just describes like oh yeah his head exploded in a microwave and it was blood everywhere so i'm cutting my toenails yeah no this is i feel like that was a pivotal scene because that's showing that like hal has this trauma like everybody has a trauma in this book that was hal's trauma and oh it, and the trauma counselor that fucking describing the trauma counselor like that he at first i was like his hands are on the desk because he's getting off on hearing he's people's jerking trauma. off yeah but he's got baby hands <laughs> what yeah baby which i think comes <laughs> into i think probably he is related somehow to the uhid uhid um, the 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 something of hideously hideously <laughs> Something the deformed the the group of deformed people. Oh my god! There's the group of deformed people that Madame Psychosis is like reading on the air, like all the maladies that that will qualify you to be a member of this group. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And that's why that. she wears the veil because that's like their thing. And I'm pretty sure he's he's uh, joined up with that. But the way he describes like going through the grieving process by reading yeah. these books because he has to because he feels like it's a test he has to win and, and then uh, accidentally having like this massive breakthrough like yeah. this massive counseling breakthrough well that's what they that's kind of counseling is which you know, is you gotta fake it until you make it yeah. yeah which is the best the best revelation in any counseling scene in any media yeah. ever he just chews that, him a new asshole basically what no the scene where he goes because my first thought when I walked in the door, and this is where all his guilt comes from. This is what he is. He is. This is why he is guilty. This is why he carries all this guilt. This is why he's so fucked up by his father's death. Is because the first thing he thinks of when he walks through the door is, oh, something smells delicious. Oh yeah, that's right. And you're just like, what the fuck? How <laughs> fucking crazy would it be to like walk into a room? And be like, yeah, somebody's cooking dinner. I'm into that. And then and my then dad's head's exploded. Yeah, <laughs> it's because your dad like microwaved his head. <laughs> it's fucking book, man. <laughs> and the whole time you're just going like, oh yeah, they, he microwaved his head. He must have died. Like it must have been like you know something weird. I don't know. Yeah. But then the way they talk about it is this completely unrealistic. He had the equivalent to what was it? Two sticks of dynamite. Yeah. inside his cranial in intracranial pressure before his head exploded and that's and, why it goes everywhere and destroys the microwave yeah and they said it was like it took 11 seconds maybe or 12 seconds for it to build up before it exploded and i'm just like can you imagine those last 11 12 seconds oh uh, man and man. he not only that but he drilled a hole in the microwave door so you know it'll turn on while the door's closed and and then he still patted it around his neck with aluminum foil to seal it in <laughs> He went yeah. through. He went through the process to. I mean, you know, there's there's got to be better ways to kill yourself. I mean, there's a bunch of junkies down the street that could probably hook you up. Uh, it's either got to do with uh, Avril and CT, yeah, or the movie. 
It's got to be one of those two or possibly a combination of both. Yeah. And like my kind of my thinking is like a lot of this book is about like the effort and like work and yeah. working at something you love and being talented at something and sort of writing on that, but also needing to work at that. You know, they sort of talk about that mm-hmm. early in the book. They're like, no, the reason you repeat all this stuff is because eventually it becomes muscle memory and you can just improve, you know, without thinking about it. You know, yes. it's, just, it's just practice. And the whole thing about this book seems to be like that what spurs that on is pain because it's another cycle in this book is there's this pain that makes you go, oh, God, I'm not a good enough tennis player. Oh, I, 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 my, my wife just slept with my brother, you know? Yeah. And then you go, I'm going to throw myself into tennis and get past this plateau or I'm going to throw myself at this project I've been working on for 10 years and finally nail Infinite Jest. Yeah. And like capturing that pain and writing it, but destroying yourself in the process. Yes. And using Pledge as sunscreen. Pledge as sunscreen. You know, I wanted to try it just because I was I wanted to see what it smelled like. Uh, well, I was like, lemons probably. <laughs> well, they keep describing it as like a funk. They're like, no, it's a terrible smell and it peels off. And I was like, ew, this sounds gross. But at the same time, you know, for posterity. Yeah, they peel off and they like have little husks that they save or some shit like that. It's weird. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised because everyone in this book is batshit insane. <laughs> yeah, even the even the other kids like they're just sitting around. They're calling each other different different things. What was it? The they're talking about sex in the locker room at one time, and and I wrote the quote down: "Bump uglies, do the nasty, haul ashes." Um, and I underlined "haul ashes" because what? Yeah, what? Uh, what does that even mean? I don't know. That, okay, that's another scene. By the way, there's a scene where all the big brothers, I guess, the big buddies, are sitting with their groups. Yeah. And it's just going from group to group to group to group. And it's 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 just bouncing between their conversations with no break in between the paragraphs. You're just mm-hmm. going boom, 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 boom. You're, like, circling all these groups. Yeah, and, and, like, the, and the sentence would start with, like, the first three words missing. Like, it was just, like, you're you're just sitting there listening to their conversation because you know he couldn't he didn't even bother writing the beginning of the sentence because they were not even bothering listening to the beginning of the sentence just it just seemed like everyone's sentence started off halfway there yeah everybody was already talking yeah you know by the time you came in and that's why i sort of had this mental image the same thing with the steeply marat scene uh the one in the desert um where these people are just going like they're, they're having this conversation, but then this steady cam shot is sort of going around to different rooms yeah. or like, you know, swiveling around to the different conversations because that was one of the most geniusly written. Those two scenes, the steeply Marath scene and then the kids, uh, the big buddies and the kids scenes were like the two where he showed how easily he can tap dance from scene to scene to scene. Oh, yeah. And you will never lose the thread of what is going on. I thought that was amazing. Like that was an incredible incredible uh and i i read and look at craft mostly and i know you probably read mostly and look at story Um yeah. uh, so like to me that was like uh that was where those two really came together like craft and story i really felt were the strongest right there because it was kind of showing like even just that snapshot scene of the big buddies talking to their kids was just this like it gave me such a better picture of what life was like at the tennis academy yeah <laughs> They, uh, he, he definitely makes you feel uh, really inadequate at writing or understanding books as you're used to reading them. Yeah, we'll, we'll, let's just go into talking generally about the book uh, yeah. real quick. So fucking David Foster Wallace is brilliant, uh, yeah. in my opinion. And it's, and it's weird because I, I've been reading a lot of articles about him and watching some different interviews and he did a lot of Charlie Rose stuff and, uh, and he did a really good uh, – commencement speech at a college and you know i read these things and i listen to him and i'm just like you know i i kind of like the way he he talks about things like he views things and and then you know you read his fiction and you're just like what the fuck is going on but this is great and um he just he had a brain that was just obviously a lot smarter than everybody else's brain and um i i thoroughly enjoy the book i i have a feeling when I finish it, um, 
I'm going to wish it hasn't, it wasn't over and that it, uh, I just, I'm going to have a feeling that I didn't quite fully understand it. I'm going to probably read other people's takes on it to see if I can fully understand it because it's got a lot of content and there's a lot of stuff in there. After I read the first two or three chapters, I was like, I was like, you know, I, I like this book. It's a good book. The guy's a good writer. I don't think I could ever sit through this again. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got to our stopping point, I am like, okay, like every five years, I need to go and buy like a different reader's companion and sit down with this book and yes. try to decipher it again. Yeah, because I have a feeling because after I, after I got to where I was uh, and when I got to that point where I found out the timeline, I – kind of reread the first chapter and I didn't I didn't like fully reread it cuz it's long as fuck but I I read through it and I was just like oh this is this is in the future okay yeah and then I was just like okay so this is basically what happened that year that made him go fucking nuts because he goes from this guy that just smokes a lot of pot that memorizes the dictionary to making animal noises but he's actually trying to communicate, so something yeah. fucking happened. And I'm just like, this is great. Because, you know, most books, it's like, it'll it'll have a prologue, and then it's like, one year ago. And I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. And this one, he's just like, fuck it, you figure it out. <laughs> no, yeah, he just go, yeah. Oh, my God. Um, we also posited that uh, David Foster Wallace knew he was brilliant mm -hmm. and wrote this book as a massive troll. Because oh, it yeah. is, I gotta say, dude, there's about forty percent troll in this book. Like oh, even reading yeah. up to this point, yeah, he's. I mean, it's first of all the plot. It's silly. I mean, it's it's silly. There's fucking wheelchair assassins. There's a there's a film that makes you addicted. There's a bunch of junkies that have really sad, depressing stories. But you know, they always say something funny every now and then. You know, it's like you troll through a little bit of uh, depressing stuff, and then all of a sudden, there's something funny happens. You're like, goddamn. Because I guess it's just to keep you hanging on, but um, yeah, he he was he's fucking with people because I think he knew that literary people are going to pick it apart, and at the end of the day, literary people are reading a book with wheelchair assassins in it. I think that might have. I think that was his thing. Is yeah. it, he is actively fucking with the reader? Like, yes. I'm just going to point that out. Like, that was my favorite part about this book, is he is actively trying to fuck with you while he's, you can tell while he's writing it, that he's going, I'm going to, I'm going to fuck around. I'm just going to fuck with people's heads. Like, they're all going to read this book, and they're going to be like, oh, it's the greatest thing ever, but I am actively going to, like, make fun of them for it. It's it's great because it's, uh, you know, the scenarios, the little goofy scenarios when they happen, the funny parts. I mean, it's it's straight out of like something that like Carl Hyacin will write or, or Dave Barry, and you know, it's just it's silly and it's ridiculous. But the thing is, is if you've ever read a Carl Hyacin or a Dave Barry book, they're not exactly good writers, and it's basically right. if a very very talented, just brilliant writer wrote a book like that and it, with his style, and it's just it's hilarious. Oh my god, this book is so the beginning, the introduction by Dave Eggers, he's he's like, Oh well, it's a bleak book, it's a hard to read book, but I promise you there's humor in there. And like <laughs> like I said, it's like forty percent like him thumbing his nose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, just going like smiling slyly at you. And yeah. like you 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 really gonna try to read this book? Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm gonna throw in some random chapters of bullshit. I hope you like it. Yeah, I hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoy. Uh, you know, it's a, like somebody's changing channel surfing. Basically, you're reading the book and you're channel surfing. It's that like, is a perfect actually yeah. analogy for it, and I hadn't thought of it until now. It I'm going to be absolutely like channel surfing. I'm going to be really pissed it's after I read this. I read a, uh, a somebody that was analyzing the book, and they use that same analogy. Oh, I'm just going man. to go out there and say I said it first. <laughs> oh man, we should um we should we should endeavor to revisit this book at some point oh, yes. in the future. Yes, because uh, I think a, a reread of this would make it just way more enjoyable. I think in about five six years, uh, when Beardy Heads made us uh, a couple of millionaires. Oh yeah, uh, we're gonna be super rich. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get super rich. Uh, everybody, uh, make sure uh, throw those donations our way. <laughs> we're gonna have hookers and blow. Yeah, we're gonna do like John Oliver and just start a church, start our own church. Um, praise be praise praise be. praise be um <laughs> our lady of perpetual exemption uh yeah i think uh this is gonna be one of those books that i come back to again and again and again it's gonna be like my next hitchhiker's guide 
<laughs> you know, like I read I for a long time in my life, my year was not complete until I spent the month of December reading Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good December book. Yeah, that's, a, that's that was yeah. my end of the year book uh, from like that. from probably about sixth grade all the way up to when I was 23, 24. And, and then I read it in my I, I think the last time I read it, I was 27 or 28. And it was incredible. It was like, oh, my God, like the, but this that gives me the same feeling. Yeah. I uh, I will say, though, that if anybody's looking at reading this or planning on it, um, I bought the book because the I, I felt that the way it was supposed to be read was tedious and you wanted to flip back to the back to read the end notes. Um, I have two bookmarks in it um, and about, I don't know, end note. 35 i was just like ah fuck it i'll just i'll just skip a few end notes and then i'll just read them all at once later on because <laughs> yeah I'm... like at the end of the chapter or something yeah because it's it's uh, there was about uh 50 pages of this i read on my kindle because this is not really a good book to hold when you're sitting up in bed reading um a kindle is perfect for that and this book is not that and you know i'm used to reading on my kindle that has a backlight and so i don't need a lamp um, but I would highly recommend reading this with a Kindle. One hundred percent agree. <laughs> I, fuck those footnotes. In the I box. am reading on Kindle. Um, I was going to buy the hard copy, but then I decided it would probably be interesting if we talked about our experience Kindle versus hard copy. Right. And I'm going to continue Wh- with the book. I I don't think I could ever read the physical book. Like, just it sounds so annoying. It sounds like it's too much like college to me, where I'm like going to the back of the book to find the answers. Like, and... I'm not interested in that. <laughs> and I think that's what he was. I think that's what he wanted you to do when he read when he wrote it. I think he was just like, you know what? I'm gonna have them read this, and then they're gonna flip to the back of the book thinking it's something super important, and it's a word. And you're just like, I kind of figured meth was short for methamphetamine. Thank you. Right, right. You're going through the back. You're going through it. You're like, all right, there's going to be some story here. And then it's like, oh, yes, B means Boston. Yeah. Or, or like BPD means Boston, Boston Police, Police Department. Yeah. And I was just like, well, that's horse shit. And then what, one of them was uh, you're reading it and you're kind of getting into the chapter because you talk about the dad and then you, uh, you see the end note and you flip over to the back and it's this long ass filmography and it's every film he ever made. And he made a lot of bullshit movies. A lot of silent films, because he is... Is a hipster. Yeah, fucking nerd. Um, and uh, make a talkie, asshole. But it's just like, he had a synopsis for every goddamn film he made, and I'm just like, God damn it, is this really that important? And the only thing about that that's important was the fact that he tried to make Infinite Jest four times before. That and I it. think, really, you could skip everything else, and that was the only thing you were supposed to get out of that, is that yeah. he's got this big, long storied film history... But there's this one film he's been trying to make again and again and again. Once again, David Foster Wallace fucking with you. Just yeah. fucking with you. Just thumbing his nose at the reader the whole time. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, I, I appreciate that because he, he had a very interesting uh, perspective on things. I sent you that link to that that speech he gave, the, This Is Water, the, the one that the people that don't like him like to rip apart, uh, which is interesting because... There's writers that are alive today that think they're hot shit. Um, and I've read a couple of the books from this guy. Uh, <coughs> Brady Sinellis. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. oh, what happened there? I and, had a frog and, in my throat, I think. I know. You know what's funny about him is he is overtly critical about everything. Like, it's to the point where I think he just hates everything. He just – I don't think there's really anything he likes. And when he likes something, it's, like, absurd, really. Um, and it's not like I'm defending him like I'm on this high horse of David Foster Wallace, but you can clearly read this book and, and note this guy is knows his shit. Like he's a good writer, and I've read Brad A. Stanley's books, and they're okay. Like he's not. I mean, he's oh, he's not a bad writer, but he's he's not like amazing. And you just hear him, and he's like, "Well, we're totally different styles." And I'm like, "Yeah, no shit. He can write like complex <laughs> complex things and." And uh, he can edit it out, chop it up into different, you know, orders. And and Brent Easton Ellis doesn't do that. Like, he just, I don't know, it's that nihilistic or it's, whatever it's, you say. It's, it. it's um Quentin Tarantino versus Eli Roth. Ugh. Like, both of them use this very shocking imagery. Both of them have these sort of weird splintered narratives. But in the end, like, 
Eli Roth is really just sort of like trying way too hard. And Quentin Tarantino sneezes out a good movie. You yeah. Know, like he literally like busts out a script and boom, everybody, everybody, you know, I don't yes. know. That's the way I feel. My, my feelings on Tarantino are well known, but yes. Um, and yeah, Hateful Eight will be amazing. I'm sure it will. Honestly, I kind of feel like the Westerns are his genre. Oh, I feel yes. like he nailed it with uh Dango and change, yes. which I don't understand why he doesn't consider a Western, but anyways, <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> it was totally a Western. Yeah. Uh, Quentin, I know you're a beardy heads fan, so yeah, I'm sure he's just like, fuck those guys. I'm going to go make a movie with film. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> complain about it. I'm gonna complain about <laughs> digital digital cinema because that's the future of film. I know, and that sucks, but you know, that's how it is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's he. You you get the feeling that uh, David Foster Wallace, um, like I said, he's he's fucking with you the entire time. But like, <gasps> I kind of wonder if all his books are like this. Yeah, I know he wrote a lot of journalism too. He wrote he wrote a lot of uh, nonfiction. Well, there's there's people that um, – because I watched a special. These people, they did like a, a book club type thing. I guess it's an, a British show or an Australian show or whatever. Uh, they did Infinite Jest, and you know, naturally half of them hated it and half of them loved it. Um, and everyone was like, oh, I read his nonfiction. His nonfiction is amazing. Like it's hilarious and well put. And then you read his fiction, and it's like, what the fuck am I reading? And, and I don't know. I just think that maybe – if we read like his nonfiction, which I am going to read, uh, especially the one about the cruise ships, something something yeah, fun, something that... something fun, I do, I'll never do again. Yeah, um, I I have a feeling that we read his nonfiction and we're just going to get a different view on him because I think his nonfiction is more it makes sense uh, and it's like traditional narrative, I guess. Uh, with, you know, because Infinite Jest, I bet, is just. It's just batshit crazy, and I I think calling it postmodern is like even just trying <laughs> to put it too much in a box. Yeah, you're trying to label something that really is its own thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean this book is seriously its own entity, and it's fascinating. And and you know it's weird because I've read books that didn't make sense. Um, Alistair Reynolds has this science fiction series. I tried to read, and it just I was like, ah, this is dumb. I didn't get it. And um, this book, for the most part. If you're not really paying attention, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But if you pay attention, it 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 does really. But it's just it's fucking insane. And you know, younger me would have probably given up on this book. Um, I'm glad I'm reading it at my age now. But if I read this maybe ten years ago, I'd have been like, or I wouldn't have even tried it. I'd have been like, oh, these literary snobs. They say it's great. I would have probably bought it and pretended to put a bunch of indentations in the spine and then put it on my bookshelf and been like, yeah, I read that. Yeah, it would have been your uh, For When a Girl Comes Over and it yeah. get laid book. Yeah. And like, I would, no, that book's crap. I would know everything about the book without having read it. <laughs> right. Well, we have we have a wonderful David Foster Wallace wiki available to us. Yes. So you could literally probably just uh, read the wiki and get, the, get a good idea what the story's about. Oh, yeah. So let me let me ask you this: uh, While you're reading, are you reading along with the wiki, or are you doing the page by page uh, second footnotes? Uh, what I've done is I've I just read it um, like normal, and then I've gone back and looked at the wiki and just to kind of see because it's it's structured by pages, and so I just do that. Yeah, and I, I've kind of I, I do like the way they've structured it. I started it that way, but then it was mostly just like preventing trips to the dictionary, which I'm okay with. Mm-hmm. And oh, uh, yes. I would recommend it if you are younger, and especially you have it if you are not going to college, don't want to go to college, haven't ever gone to college to learn a bunch of more useless words that you will only ever use in when you read books like this. By David Foster Wallace. By I'm David sure. Foster Wallace. A bunch or... of bunch of the shits in the Pale King, probably. Yeah, Probably more some than goofy likely. ass words. More than likely, um, yeah, I would recommend it uh, if 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 you don't have a giant vocabulary. And there's even, like I said, there's even there's words in there I don't know, and I read all sorts of dumb shit like this. Oh yeah, yeah, you I know? read all the time, and I'm just like, I don't know what the what he was saying there, but okay. Like words I have never, like I said, I don't even know the root word for what some of these words. <laughs> it's like Miss Fur- Furlunkicated. And I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, what's a furlunk? 
I don't even, yeah. I don't even, I've never even heard of a furlong, and that's not <laughs> a real word, obviously. But I feel like I don't know. Yeah. But he's 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 a wordsmith. He's a wonderful, wonderful words, or he was. Yes. He's uh, dead now. Yeah, yeah. He didn't put his head in the microwave though. I I think oh, that. God, wouldn't that have been great? Yeah, that would have. That would have been interesting. I would have been like, first of all, I'm like, that's an awful, awful way to kill yourself. Oh my god, I know. <laughs> I mean, come on, just just start the car in the garage. I mean, do it, <laughs> do it the nice way. I mean, we've all thought it. Which yeah. way, which way's the nice way? And it's that. Don't don't take a bunch of pills because you're gonna get sick and it's gonna hurt. You know, go to sleep in the garage with the car running. Don't put your head in the microwave. Don't, don't hang yourself. Don't, don't put your head in the microwave. Yeah, why Actually, would you put your head in the microwave? Also, just don't kill yourself. Choose life. Come on. Choose life. Exactly. Yeah. Come on, Oren. In, in, the, in, the Oren. Words, in, in the words of Nancy Reagan, look at life with all the colors that God gave us. <laughs> what, a beautiful, what a beautiful Nancy Reagan quote. Yeah, I, I'm, I've been watching Narcos. Uh, I'm on my second watching of it and uh yeah they have some nancy reagan in there it's great oh is that about the drug war in the 80s it's uh, it's about pablo escobar motherfucker <laughs> it's oh. not not just the war it's about pablo fucking escobar <laughs> oh we're gonna have to talk about this it's a great great At fucking some point maybe yeah. maybe maybe we'll have to start doing like some episodic watches of shows but anyways all, all i know is netflix is killing it but oh they uh yes i would say our next stopping point uh, I think we agreed on page 450, and I'm reading the, I guess it's a trade paperback by Back Bay Books. You'll know it because there's like, this book's only been published like a couple times, but um, the best way to find out it's the right stopping point is I'm looking at the page now. Uh, on that page is in note 180, 180. So that's the stopping point. Yeah. And is that the end of a chapter or anything, or would you yeah. stop there at that end note? In note 180, uh, there's one more paragraph right after that, and then that's the end of a chapter, and it starts off with the November 9th of the year of the pins. So, Jesus yeah. Christ, 200 pages and we've only gone three days? Oh, yeah. Fucking A. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to jump in the future, and then a little in the past, and then there's going to be some junkies, and then there's going to be some, some kids speaking some street, you know, and they're hitting each other with coat hangers and... And, and, and then a Frenchman is going to murder somebody from a wheelchair. And then they're gonna, and then they're gonna barely talk about the entertainment. And I have a feeling like the last, maybe the last third of this book, uh, will be you know, make more sense. I guess. Well, I will tell you this: the uh, chapter uh, in, in on the Kindle, it has the little markers at the bottom of the screen for the little chapters. Yeah, you know, it tells you how far you are and how many chapters are left. Like the last chapter is probably over half the book. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's a good 500 pages. Yeah, we're going to have trouble finding a stopping point with that one. I mean, I think it's broken up because all the other chapters are. Yeah, they're they broken have a up little... into different days. So, I mean, we'll we'll be able to get two or three episodes out of it, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, that's, this is a good starting book because this has kept us... Uh, this this is this has given us a lot of good uh a, a lot of good fodder for discussion. Oh yeah, and uh, we're definitely gonna do something a lot easier next. Yeah, maybe yeah. shorter. <laughs> something we could just do one episode on. <laughs> I think I think shooting for one to two episodes, and then maybe once a year we'll do a big extravaganza read. Uh, I think that's probably the way to go. Yeah, um, that's good. Yeah. Uh, Cause I, I'll be honest with you, I'm loving reading this book, but goddamn, uh, yeah. stack it on, stack it on top of my college textbooks, uh, and stuff I got to read for work and whatnot, and we're on a whole other level. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, well, I'm gonna start reading it again tonight. <laughs> yep. Back to it tonight. <laughs> yeah, I gotta stop reading my book that makes sense. <laughs> Con- Conqueror's Pride by Timothy Zahn. Highly recommend it. Uh, well, don't forget, uh, guys, if you are enjoying Beardy Heads Book Club, you can give us a follow over on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Beardy Heads. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at uh, Beardy Heads. You can follow me on Twitter at Whole Enchilada. And I'm at SB Font. Uh, you can also. Uh... Oh, I think Dave, was... Dave doesn't have a Twitter. No, Dave's not on Twitter. But well, uh, we're going to make for... fun of him. It's probably going to be some stupid username involving beer. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be, you know, it, it, you're absolutely right. But, uh, 
Uh, don't forget to uh, follow us over on Twitch as well. Uh, we are video game streamers by nature, although I, th- I feel like we're having a lot more fun podcasting. Yeah, I'd like to get into streaming. I just have this thing called a family and uh, no free time. So Yeah, I'm with you. And I, I, I mean, I, I don't have a family, but I don't have free time either. If I, if I didn't have uh, a full-time job, I'd probably be streaming uh, eight hours a day. Yep, ditto here. That yeah. would be what I would do instead of looking for a full-time job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I'm just going to take a shot and see if I can make it. Yeah. You know, just bet the farm on this motherfucker. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, other than that, uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's about it. I think that wraps us up for uh, episode one of Infinite Jest. Uh, am, I, am I missing anything? Uh, no, I guess our next episode will be two weeks from now. Uh, we're going to... We're going to try to have a game cast in out in the meantime uh, when Dave comes back from Alaska or hunting bears with his bare hands and knives. I don't know. He's doing something with, with in Alaska. Yeah. Um, so he'll be he'll be back next weekend, uh, and we're going to try to record a game cast next weekend in the meantime so you know there's not a lull in between. And then the week after that, we'll have another book book club episode, book cast, whatever the fuck we're called. Book club. Yeah, Beardy Infinite book Just club. episode two. Yeah, and we'll try not to talk about Metal Gear Solid Five too much. Yeah, well, I mean, all that's lost to the ages now. Well, thanks a lot, Jake. Make sure you export the file when we're fucking done talking. I will, I will. But I'm going to be playing Metal Gear Solid in two days, just so you know. It's going to be really hard for me to read this book. If that's I read fine. Four, if I read 14 to 15 pages a day, I can be fine. I think I one think, of those days I'm just gonna sit down and read about fifty of it. Yeah, I was gonna say that's 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 how I've gone is I I tend to binge on it, but I do need time for video games. I just upgraded the I just upgraded Marvin, and it's time it's time it's, it's time. just time. And speaking of time, I think this podcast is time to end. Time to end. Uh, well, I'm Jake, and I'm Stephen, and I peed in his coffee. Yeah, don't forget about that little bit. Uh, That was uh, Beardy Heads Book Club, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, bye. You've been listening to another great episode of Beardy Heads Book Club. Our theme was provided by the amazingly talented Dwayne Andrews. Find more music like it at DwayneAndrews.ca. Don't forget to find the Beardy Heads on Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, and Instagram. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you again real soon.